Yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Candice, for the introduction. Um, I'm the Marcus here in this webinar, and I quickly wanted to add that Stefan and me combined have about three decades of uh, experience with TLA+. And in this webinar, the two of us will take turns showing you what TLA+, the temporal logic of actions, is and what it, combined with its uh, tool set, can do in order to make sense of reactive systems, that is, concurrent and distributed systems that are notoriously hard to get right, right correct? Because I guess this is the reason why you're here. In your career, in your tenure as a software engineer, you've realized that building correct concurrent and distributed systems is super difficult. Yeah, if they ought to be reliable so that the operation and the maintenance of these systems is relatively cheap, it's very difficult, it's very hard. And this is really the bread and butter where TLA Plus comes in, designing these systems so that they live up to the expectations. For example, um, our colleagues in the industry have used TLA Plus to design planetary scale distributed databases, concurrency primitives that exist in the standard libraries of your favorite programming languages, but also client facing applications, distributed applications running on cloud services, microservice architectures. All of these have been designed with TLA plus. Unfortunately, we don't have time to look into these systems today because we really only have one, one hour, so we can't study um, real world systems. But we selected a representative of a concurrent system uh, on which we will demonstrate the powers of TLA plus. And I could even imagine that some of you might have already implemented such a system in one way or another. It's easy to explain. We have a front end back end system. So we have in the front end, we have producers that create some sort of data, the piece over here. In this case, there are four, and they want to send data to the back end. Yeah. This could be a user request, for example, that the back end has to act upon. And the front end, the producers add the data requests into some data structure. Let's call this buffer today. Um, where it will be queued until the consumers remove the remove individual elements from the buffer. And if you like, in the multi-threading world, this would be an array that sits between the threads, the front end and the uh, back end threads, or in the uh, multi-process world. This could be inter-process communication, IPC, right? But also then in the distributed world, the four nodes, the four uh, circles here could be nodes that send via some middleware, some messaging bus or so on, um, data to some backend system. The unifying property of the middleware here, the array, the IPC is that it has some fixed size that causes the producers to block at some point. Yeah, if the buffer is full, the producers have to wait. And they wait until they get a signal um, from the buffer that there is room available once a consumer removes an element from it. And this is all great and dandy, and things go back and forth between the producers and the consumers until the point where this thing unfortunately deadlocks. Okay, I will now switch over from the diagram here, from the abstract world that we like to study in TLA plus to the nitty gritty details of the concurrent program. So you see a bit of rust code over here and everything outside of what I don't discuss is irrelevant. Here is the implementation of the algorithm I just explained. Yeah, the producers, a set of producers execute this function here. And what the producer does is it locks the buffer, uh, it gets exclusive access to the buffer. There is no concurrency going on with other producers or consumers. And when the producer has exclusive access <clears throat> of the buffer, it checks whether or not the buffer is empty. Uh, sorry, if the buffer is full. And if the buffer is full, the producer knows that it has to wait, in which case it waits, yields the lock, and signals some other producer or consumer that there is, uh, uh, and waits for the uh, waits for a signal. 
in the case that there is room in the buffer, an element gets added to the buffer and the producer signals to one other party that there is now one more element in, in the data structure. And like I said, mutually exclusive, the consumers carry out this piece of code here. They also lock the buffer, check if the buffer is empty. If it's empty, they wait, wait for the signal. If there is an element in the buffer, they remove it and send a signal in turn. So now, where's the deadlock? I've already consulted with our favorite AI buddy, and it says, as an answer to the question whether or not this code is deadlock free, well, <clears throat> based on the code you provided, it appears that the code is deadlock free. The producer and consumer threads are using a shared buffer and a condition variable to synchronize access to the buffer. The producer thread waits on the condition variable if the buffer is full, and the consumer thread waits on the condition variable if the buffer is empty. This ensures that the producer and the consumer threads do not access the buffer at the same time. Yeah, That's what I said. They are mutually exclusive, which would cause a race condition. That's also true, right? If we would have no lock, then there would be garbage in the buffer eventually. Therefore, the code is designed to avoid deadlocks. Well, this sounds a bit fuzzy to me. There are either deadlocks or there are no deadlocks. Yeah? Avoiding deadlocks is like, um, you might have a good day or not. So let's see if we can get some more clarity to that by, for example, just testing this piece of code. Yeah? How about we run our Rust implementation here with a buffer of size three, four producers, and three consumers? Now, this indeed does deadlock, uh, deadlocks. And we get this debug output here that is, um, I guess, a couple thousand, 10,000 lines long. Now, we would somehow have, um, have to make sense of the output here to diagnose where the deadlock is coming from. But maybe, maybe I should just um, start with a smaller configuration, right? Maybe just one. Buffer of size one, one producer, and one consumer. And now we wait for this thing to deadlock. And in the meantime, I will hand over to Stefan, who will now use this time while we wait for this to deadlock to explain to you um, what the TLA plus specification of this buffer producer consumer system looks like. Okay, thanks, Marcus. Let me just share my screen. <clears throat> okay. So uh, here you see a TLA uh, version of the system that Marcus has been explaining to you. Now, TLA is not like a programming language. Uh, it's a bit more mathematical things. Um, so what we are doing here is uh, forget about this extent. This is just some import of standard libraries. Um, we are declaring some parameters. So a set of producers, a set of consumers, and the capacity of the buffer that we're going to use. And as you can notice, um, there, there are no type annotations, right? These are just names, identifiers that, uh, that are introduced here. Uh, and by default, everything in, in, in TLA is a set, or at least it, it is an untyped language. Okay, so what we are doing here is we, we introduce, oops, we introduce um, an assumption on these constants, which says, okay, producers should be an non-empty set, consumers should be an non-empty set. I mean, if we don't have no producers and no consumers, the, the, the problem is not interesting. Also, we are assuming producers and consumers to be disjoint. Think of that as uh, at least their roles being disjoint. And also there's a buffer and it has a capa capacity, which is a natural number. And it shouldn't be zero, a zero place buffer doesn't make sense either, right? <clears throat> so these are explicit assumptions that we have to state. And then we are going to model the actual system. And for modeling the system, we are using two variables here. Uh, one variable that represents the buffer and the other variable that uh, represents the set of waiting processes. 
either producers that are blocked because the buffer is currently full or consumers that are blocked because the buffer uh, is currently empty or was empty at the time where they tried to access the buffer. Okay, uh, this definition of VARs is just a, a, a tuple containing both of the variables. Uh, more important is the definition here, the set of running threads, <clears throat> that's all the producers and consumers. So producers set union consumers, this backslash cup means set union in TLA plus. Remember that those are sets, right? But we subtract the set of waiting processes, right? <clears throat> okay, so these are the, the set of producers and consumers that are not currently waiting. And then we have notify and wait operations similar to what Marcus showed in the Rust code. <clears throat> and so a notify, what will it do? Well, if some process some, uh, is waiting, some producer or consumer is waiting, then it will wake up one of the waiting uh, processes. So <clears throat> and we don't care which one, and there's no notion of random numbers or probabilities and TLA. So we just pick an arbitrary one we say, okay, we remove some element of the weight set from uh, from the from the current weight set. So weight set prime here denotes the value of, of weight set after that uh, notify action takes place. right? And the new value of weight set is the old value with that element x removed. And x is just an arbitrary element that is in the weight set, right? And we are, Sure, because uh, we just checked that the weight set, set is not non empty. Well, if the weight set is empty, <clears throat> notify is just a no up, so we don't change the weight set. And similarly, the weight operation uh, just adds uh, a thread or a process T <clears throat> to the weight set. Well, the two main operations now that we have in the system is put and get. And that two cases, so put will be invoked by a producer. Right, and this models uh, producer T adding a data item D to the buffer, right? And there are two cases. So this is a disjunction. We, in TLA, we write that as a list where uh, <clears throat> disjunctions and conjunctions are basically the bullet items of a list. So there are two cases. Either the, the, uh, there is room in the buffer, so the length of the current length of the buffer is below the capacity. And then we can just append the data item to the buffer. And that means now there's an item available and will notify one of the processes using our <clears throat> operator notifier that we just defined above. Uh, the, the second case is if the buffer is full. So if the length of the buffer is equals the capacity, and then uh, the producer has to wait and we invoke the wait uh, operator that, that we just defined. And the get is symmetric. So get means a, a consumer trying to retrieve a data item. So for simplicity, we just ignore the, actually the data item because at the end of the day, we're interested in finding a deadlock or not. So which item is read is not really not important. So this is a, a message. Uh, when Whenever you're modeling a system, think about what is relevant and what you leave out. Um, there's no universal model of a system, you write a model or a specification for a certain purpose. And here we are interested in deadlock checking. And so we can actually forget the, the data values. We still included the um, data values in the put operation, simply because it will make inter interpreting uh, counter examples that we get easier. Okay, <clears throat> otherwise the, the two operations are symmetric. And then we tie everything together. So we, we are describing a state machine. So we are describing the initial state in which the system starts. So initially the buffer is empty. So the empty sequence is written like that in TLA. <clears throat> and the weight set is the empty set, which is written like this. <clears throat> and then we uh, describe all the possible transitions in the system. And so, Traditionally, th these operators are called init for the initial condition next for the next state relation, but really these are just names. You can call them whatever you like. Anyway, the, the transition relation says, well, there exists, this backslash E means there exists some running thread T. So some thread that's not in the weight set, remember. 
such that either T is a producer and then it will do a put. And here we just insert its identity into the buffer that makes it easier to, to, to find out uh, which uh, process just executed. Or T is a consumer and will get some, something from the buffer. Okay, so this is our TLA specification. Now, now the question is, what can we do? So we are interested in deadlock. So let's <clears throat> do deadlock checking with, uh, with uh, TLA. And for that, we'll use the model checker. Now, if, you, if I go back up to, my, to the start of my, of my module, I declare these parameters here, producers, consumers, and buff capacity. So for the model checker, I have to instantiate those parameters. Just like Marcus said, well, I'm running the system for, I don't know, four producers, three consumers, I believe, <clears throat> with a certain buffer size. I have to do the same for TLC. And we do that in the configuration file. So the, you see the configuration file over here. So we declare the, the constants that we want to use. So here I'm just taking a very, the smallest possible configuration, basically, that makes sense. I'm saying, well, Let's try with a buffer capacity of one, one producer that I'm just calling P1 <clears throat> and one consumer that's called C1. And then I have to tell TLC, the model checker, uh, what are actually the initial state predicate and the next state relation that are going to be used. Okay. Okay, once this is done, I can just run the model checker. So I'll do that here from the interface. So check model with TLC. I start it up. And here you can see the output of TLC. So it has finished and it tells us, well, everything went fine. I didn't find any problem. And it gives us a few statistics about the number of states, etc. Okay. So with this small configuration, everything seems to work. So let's try a slightly larger, larger configuration. Let's, for example, add a second producer. Right? So I'm just adding a second producer here. And I'm restarting my model checker. Aha, uh -huh. now we see something. It tells us deadlock reached. Okay. And <clears throat> so a deadlock appears to be possible in this configuration. And not only does it tell us that deadlock exists, it gives us a trace. And we could follow and, and explore what it's doing. But if we just look at the end of the trace, we see that indeed both producers and the consumer are in the wait set. So nothing can happen anymore, right? Because our next state relation says, well, you have to pick some running thread and now there's no running thread left. So nothing can happen. So this is a deadlock. Okay. Okay, so for that configuration, we, we get a deadlock. Let's try what happens if we increase the buffer capacity, if we <clears throat> give it a bit more space. Check again. Okay, no deadlock. Uh, okay, let's let's try the example that Marcus had. I believe it was four producers and three consumers. Ah, uh -huh, deadlock. Marcus, have you found the deadlock in your? No, still running. Okay, so TLC is, is quite fast at, at, at finding this, right? It's, it's faster than just running the program and waiting for the deadlock to occur. Okay, uh, so let's let's investigate a bit further. What, what's really going on here? And let me just switch to <clears throat> another uh, configuration. So by the way, all of these uh, specifications are available on GitHub. Uh, so we'll probably post the, uh, the URL and actually you, you get the history uh, with the different steps that we are showing and even more steps than, than we are showing here. And, and you can actually redo these experiments for yourself. So I'm just switching to a later version of this repository. I should probably take it, force it to do that because I made some changes. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so <clears throat> this is still the same as before. Nothing has really changed here. Uh, 
But there are two predicates that were added to the TLA specification uh, because often you want to do a bit more than just running TLC without any property. Typically, you want to, to tell it, well, <clears throat> verify some properties for us. And so here we give it two properties to, to be verified. Well, the first one is just some bookkeeping, basically. As I told you, TLA is untyped, so it's very easy to get the types wrong. <clears throat> and so it's always a good idea to write a type correctness uh, predicate and then let uh, the model checker check it for you. So what this type correctness predicate tells us is, okay, buffer will always be a sequence of producers. Remember that the producer insert their own identity into the buffer. <clears throat> the length of the buffer is actually bounded. It's always between zero and capacity, so we don't overrun the, the length of the buffer. And the weight set, the other variable, well, it's a subset. It's a set of producers and consumers, right? It's a set of threads. So this is the boring invariant, but it's still useful to verify. And the other invariant, the one that we are really interested in, is that <clears throat> uh, it's never the case. So this hash mark here means different. Think, think of it graphically. It's like, like you would write not equal in, on paper. It looks a bit like a, a not equal sign. <clears throat> so weight set is different from the union of producers and consumers, right? And if I go back to my uh, configuration file, okay, we have the same configuration that we just ran it on. And now we tell TLC to verify these two <clears throat> invariants. And of course, we already know that in this uh, configuration, um, that will fail because we get a deadlock and now um, TLC actually tells us, okay, your invariant is, is violated. And, and here's a trace that shows how it can be violated. Okay, in this, with this relatively large configuration, of course, the trace is much longer than the, the small one that we had before with our configuration with just two producers and one consumer, right? So it is usually a good idea to to check your specifications for very small instances. Uh, model checking, unlike testing, will explore exhaustively <clears throat> this restricted uh, state space uh, that you indicate by instantiating your parameters. And so you are likely to find violations of invariants or, or deadlocks in our case <clears throat> uh, for very small configurations. Okay, and, and again, let's give it a, a bit more room. Let's move to buffer capacity four. <clears throat> we run the model checker. And now the error disappears. Okay, so there's a correlation between the, the size of the, of the buffer <clears throat> and, the, and the, the, the existence of a deadlock, existence on a non-existence of a deadlock. So uh, we know that there is a problem with our uh, with our system, at least for certain configurations. What can we do to get rid of this? So what's the uh, what's the reason for the uh, for the deadlock? Well, you, the good way to find out is to to examine the the country example that you get. So let me <clears throat> let me go back to our small configuration because then it's easier to read. All right, this was our small configuration. Let's rerun TLC. Okay. <clears throat> and it tells us, okay, here we are in this deadlock state where everybody is waiting. And what happened just before, <clears throat> so we had uh, one producer and one consumer waiting. <clears throat> and then apparently um, P2 tried to de deposit, but the buffer was already full, so it was just added to the weight set. What happened before? Um, well, here is an interesting transition, right? In this step here. <clears throat> because here the buffer is empty, and then apparently producer P1 came along and inserted it, and it notified, right? Because it was able to, uh, to, to deposit an item. But what happened is here that <clears throat> producer P2 disappeared from the weight set, right? So the producer actually 
woke up another producer. And of course, that will not be helpful <clears throat> because it should have woken up the consumer, right? Because the consumer would have emptied the buffer and then the system would have, uh, would have been able to make progress. So examining the counterexample a little bit, we can, we can see that the problem is this non-deterministic notify here, right? That just says, well, wake up some process. So what we should, what we, now there are several solutions to that, uh, right? So one possible solution is to wake up all waiting uh, processes. So this would be a valid solution. And if indeed, if you look at the web page, you'll, you'll find that it is discussed there. But of course, it comes with a performance penalty because now you, you wake up all the processes. So you, you potentially get a hit on, on your system because they all try to execute now. So what we could do is, <clears throat> uh, well, if, a, if like here, um, a producer succeeds to deposit an item, what it should actually do is wake up some consumer, right? And, and vice versa, if a consumer succeeds and removes an item, then it should wake up a producer because then the producer has a chance to deposit another item. So let's see how we can, we can model that in, in TLA. Just jumping ahead in the history. <clears throat> Okay, so what changed here is um, in the in the put and also in the get operations, instead of just notifying some process, uh, the, this has been replaced by notify other, right? So we'll, the idea is that we'll uh, notify some instance of the other class of, of, of processes here. And this is how notify other is defined. Um, so you see down here, what appears inside this lead expression is pretty similar to what we had before. If the set here is empty, then we remove some element of the set from the weight set, and otherwise uh, we leave the weight set unchanged. But instead of applying this to S equal weight set, as we had before, we are a bit more clever here and we say, okay, if uh, the thread that calls this operation is actually a producer, then we take the consumers in the weight set, which we can define as the weight set with the set of producers removed. We could also have written weight set intersect uh, the set of consumers, that would be the same. And otherwise, if it's a consumer, we'll wake up a producer. So we, the set of interest is now the waiting uh, producers, the weight set without the consumers. Okay, so let's make sure that this is actually a fix. <clears throat> okay, I'm, I'm going back to my uh, configuration here that failed before, that had a deadlock, and I'm checking the same invariance as before. So let's run the model checker. And yep, it says there's no deadlock anymore, at least for this configuration. All right, <clears throat> so that looks good. Uh, Apparently we, we got rid of our of our deadlock. But can we be sure of that? I mean, actually, we just checked for this for this one instance, right? So let's we could of course try the small instance that we had before with two producers and one consumer. Okay, that also works. <clears throat> and you, you can go on and, and check some, some other instances. But are we convinced that, that this is now really true? Or should we, uh, how, do, how do we know that it works now for, for an arbitrary con um, combination of, of set of producers, set of consumers and, and buffer size? So one way to do that is to say, okay, we don't find any errors anymore. So TLC is great for finding errors because it's, it's, it's easy to launch and gives you counterexamples that you can inspect and understand what's, what actually the, the source of the error is. But once TLC doesn't find any problem anymore, they don't know so much, right? So what you can do then is you can, you can switch to theorem proving. That takes a bit more effort, <laughs> let, let me warn you. But still, 
let's let's do it for this example. It's not too difficult to do it here. So unless, unfortunately, I have to change the interface now. So so far, I was doing everything from the VS Code extension. Um, the Proof Assistant for TLA Plus is not yet integrated in, in the VS Code extension, so I have to switch to another interface, uh, to an Eclipse-based interface, the TLA Toolbox. Okay, so this is exactly the same uh, TLA specification that we saw before. And now we want to actually prove, um, uh, I guess I should, I should go one step ahead. That makes my life a little easier. I have to don't have to type so much. Okay, let's go back here. <clears throat> uh, so this is the same as I said, the, the same the same specification. What has changed now is this part down here, <clears throat> uh, where we are writing a, a lemma, in particular, at the end here, right? And the first theorem that we are proving is type correctness, right? We have to, we have two um, correctness predicates. One is um, type correctness. The other one is the absence of deadlock. So let's start with the easy one, um, the type correctness. And now we have to write an, ex, an explicit proof of that. And the standard way to proving such an invariant is to say, well, okay, the invariant is implied by the initial condition. That's what the first line here says. Let me just remove that for a moment. <clears throat> uh, second, the uh, type invariant is preserved by the next state relation. So whenever I start in a state where type invariant is true, right? I'm assuming type of invariant here. I'm also assuming that I'm taking a step of my specification, which, which, ex which is expressed by this formula next here. Then uh, this implication, then, type, then the type invariant will still be true in the state after that transition. Remember these primes mean state in the state, it's true in the state after the transition, right? And once I have proved those two uh, steps, I can conclude the theorem, which is says uh, spec implies that this type invariant is always true. So this empty box here means always. And uh, this is just a consequent of these first two steps here, right? So I have to explain why this is true. I have to explain that to the prover. I'm writing a proof here. I'm saying, okay, use the first two steps here, one, one, and one, two, and something that's called propositional temporal logic, because this always operator is an operator of temporal logic. And I launch the prover. And come on. Oh, no. I thought I got rid of this. Oh, yeah, I, I know what I did. I switched to the wrong version. Let me, because otherwise we'll have that box popping up all the time. Ah. Do a force here. Okay, now we should get rid of these annoying boxes. Uh, the annoying errors. Okay, so this proof went through, <clears throat> uh, but we still haven't proved the, the other two steps. So if I try to prove the entire theorem, um, the interface tells me, well, there's some yellow here because there are two steps that you haven't proved yet. So the QED step is fine, but the other two steps you still have to prove. Okay, and in this case, these proofs are very easy. They will be found automatically. And actually I can just write obvious so these proofs are obvious. Okay, it, it is obvious. And this one will also be obvious. Okay, and so we have proved um, uh, our theorem. So why are they obvious? Well, actually we told the prover up here to use everything that it has as, as ex at its disposal. So our assumption about the parameters and also all the definitions that appear here. This is usually not a very good idea to silently expand everything, but for small specifications such as this one, it, it works. And this uh, saves me some typing. Otherwise I would have had to tell the prover in these, in these steps here, which definitions it should expand. So I can rerun the prover on the entire theorem and everything will be green. Okay, great. So our type invariant is correct. That's reassuring, but we are, what we are really interested in 
is our invariant and uh, okay so i can write it like that Let's say inf <clears throat> what we want to prove is that our specification implies always the invariant is true right and so we can try to do the same we can try to prove that our invariant is true in the initial state and that if we start from a state where the invariant is true and we take a step then the invariant will be preserved and then everything should follow as before right so let's check the qed step first and that is fine <clears throat> um okay let's be bold obvious obvious great obvious here Hmm. So something turned red here, which means the proof has not been able, and I will try one back and after the other, and I'll just kill it here because it will not be able to prove it. Okay, so this step does not go through it. And the proof is unable to prove it. And on the right hand side here, you see the actual formula that it's trying to prove, and you can stare at it for, for a while and try to find out why why this doesn't go through is it the prover that's too stupid or is is there a problem so that's not so obvious okay but <clears throat> uh, fortunately okay there's one thing we can try maybe it, it's missing the type invariant right M maybe the type invariant would have helped here so let's throw in the type invariant as well and and now i have to justify why i'm 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 allowed to use this extra assumption that the type invariant holds in the step before, but this is okay because we just proved our type correctness lemma that says, well, the type invariant is always true, right? So I'm, I add this to the justification of the QED step. Yep, the QED step still works. And now I can try this step again. But unfortunately, it still doesn't work. Okay, let's try to understand what the what the issue is here. And now let's go back to TLC because TLC can be a great help for understanding um, what the problem is. Uh, so I hope I'm at the same point here, right? Yep. <clears throat> so what we are trying to prove here is that whenever we start from a state in which okay we're type correct and our invariant holds and we do a step then the invariant will still be true in the next state and now we can enlist the help of of tlc in proving that by saying well this is actually something like um uh like uh, like the invariant checking that we did before we just replace our initial condition by this um by this predicate that 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 we are starting from so this conjunction of type inf and invariant and i think i i defined a, a predicate up here that has just this conjunction so that i don't have to i can can use it here in the configuration file so i just tell um tlc well assume that we are starting from a from a state in which this invariant holds uh, do we preserve our our invariant in the in the next state and of course we do that again just for a finite state model but we are looking for a country example now and as we said tlc is great for finding country examples so unfortunately here tlc doesn't give us a country example it actually couldn't handle what we are trying to do it tells us the right hand side of in is not enumerable at on line 62 which is up here so this is this definition here that says, well, the buffer should be a sequence of producers. Now, unfortunately, this is an infinite set, right? Because we, we say, well, this is just a sequence. This can be of arbitrary length. So we should make this a finite set. So let me just introduce a, an auxiliary definition here. And this is a bit of, of TLA plus hackery 
So you have to, to know the expression language of, of TLA. So I'm saying, well, it's a finite sequence. So it's a function of the type one to N to the set of producers uh, for some N <clears throat> that is between zero and the cardinality of producers, right? And then let's replace this here by Protsec for the moment. And there's another problem here. It can also cannot handle this subset equal here. So I'll write in subset because it can handle in expressions. And writing this is exactly the same as writing subset equal. So that doesn't make a difference. Okay, let's try again. Ah, uh, now TLC was able to run and it gives us a counterexample, <clears throat> right? Well, it says, well, if you start from this state here where the buffer is empty and almost all the process processes except for one consumer are in the weight set, then um, that consumer may come along and try to retrieve an element and it won't succeed. So it will be added to the weight set. And so your invariant will be false at the, at the successor state. Okay, but wait a minute. I mean, if if the buffer is empty, um, then how can it be <clears throat> that uh, that all the producers are waiting? Right, producers are waiting essentially because the the buffer was full when they start when they try to deposit something. Right. So that should not happen when the when the buffer is in it is is empty, right? So let's let's rule that out by adding a clause to our invariant and say, well, if the buffer is actually empty, then there should be at least one producer that is not waiting, right? That is not in the not in the wait set. Okay, let's see if that works. Okay, we get a different counterexample, <clears throat> uh, but it's the symmetric one right here. So we have the last um, producer that's coming al along in a, in a state where, where the buffer is full and all the consumers are waiting. Okay, so we need to probably need the symmetric condition as well. So if the buffer is full, so if the buffer length equal buff capacity, uh, then there exists a consumer that is not waiting, right? Oops. Consumers, oh, let's make it a, a C that's a little nicer for consumers. Okay. And now TL, TLC at least tells us now you have a chance of proving that because apparently there's no counterexample anymore. At least TLC doesn't find a counterexample. Okay. <clears throat> so that's a candidate now. Uh, so let's get, go back to our prover. And let's just uh, maybe let me just revert this uh, because maybe the prover will have a hard time with that. Maybe for the prover, it will be easier to write it in the way it was before. Right. <clears throat> and okay, the interface messed up the colors, but this theorem still goes through. And now let's see what happens with the second lemma. Oh, success. Okay. Okay, so I'm, I rushed you a little bit because we have so little time. But what I wanted to show you, if you really uh, are interested in in arbitrary configurations, then you can use the the proof assistant uh, to 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 show correctness for an arbitrary configuration, and not just uh, a, a fixed finite configuration as with the model checker. 
And with that, I'll hand over to Marcus again, who will tell us more about what his Java program is doing and, and whatever else he wants to show us. Okay, if you can hear me. So uh, I think the Java, the, the Rust program, the test of the Rust program at some point uh, also deadlocked. When I increased it to a bigger configuration, it kept running forever, forever, forever. No chance reproducing um, the deadlock with bigger configurations because the contact sample gets so long. And now if you think about this, for example, in a system that dynamically scales up and down, uh, you might run, your system might run into the deadlock when there's high load, but then it doesn't, it's guaranteed to never exhibit the deadlock if there's low, low load of the system, for example. But maybe <clears throat> to switch gears here. So we've now demonstrated use TLC to find the counter example, find the deadlock, then verify that for a finite instance of the system, notifying all producers and all consumers at every step is a fix that also notifying the other parties is a fix. And then Stefan proved the solution correct, that there is now guaranteed no deadlock for any uh, configuration. And we might declare victory and we are almost out of time. Um, call it a day and go home and are happy. Yeah. Contrary to other tools, we now know that this thing is deadlock free. <clears throat> but there might actually be a second kind of problem here in our system. Even though the system as a whole does not deadlock and there's always forward progress, it's possible that some of the producers or some of the consumers do not make forward progress and that they get stuck. stuck. Individual processes get stuck, but not the system as a whole. And TLA Plus has first-class language to state that the system is starvation-free. What I just described, we call starvation freedom, so that for all producers, they eventually and repeatedly make forward progress. Yeah? More formally, for all produ P and producers, repeatedly, always eventually, a put action happens and the variables change. And for all consumers, they repeatedly receive an element, take an element, get an element out of the, of the buffer. And we can even check this kind of property with TLC. And contrary to the deadlock we saw earlier, where the counter example was a prefix of a behavior, a finite prefix, a finite sequence of states where the last state violated um, our correctness property invariant. Now here, we no longer get a prefix, a sequential sequence, but an actual loop. Because here's a behavior where some producer from the set of all of our producers never gets to produce um, add an element to the buffer. And this is what's called aliveness property. Deadlock is, an, is, is a safety property or is a safety property and a, a violation of it is a finite prefix of a behavior. This one here is um, a aliveness property and a violation of a aliveness property is um, a sequence, an infinite behavior where the desired thing never happens. And we can check liveness properties with TLC and there's also uh, support to reason about the correctness of uh, liveness properties in the upcoming TLA uh, PS release. And I think with that, since we only have 10 minutes left, it's probably a good idea if we open the floor for questions. So I think we covered some of the questions during the talk um, offline, but now folks, please, please feel free to ask more questions. Okay, I see a question about um, TLC and uh, TLA PS, so the, the languages that they use. So both of them um, use TLA plus. 
Um, well, TLA plus is a, is a really expressive language. Actually, it is full mathematical set theory. So no tool will be able to handle all of it. And in particular, the model checker has, has a subset of the language. And the proof assistant, so TLAPS, can handle, in principle, can handle a, a larger subset of, of TLA plus. Uh, for technical reasons, actually, the two fragments are not completely um, comparable. So there are some limitations to what TLC can handle. There are some limitations to what TLAPS can handle. There's another tool that we didn't show here that's called Appalachia, which is what's called a symbolic model checker. And it has yet another subset of the language. So that comes with tools. They, they, they don't handle the full ex expressiveness of, of the language. Okay, I guess then I go next and answer the question is, do we write spec for implemented code or write spec and then translate the spec into code? Well, the best, the most bang for your buck you get if you write the specification before you write the code. Yeah, make sure that your design is right before you make the effort of implementing it in some programming language. Yeah, to some degree, you could argue that TLA plus is the ultimate agile um, tool because you get to prototype without writing code. Um, but obviously, the world is, is full of existing code uh, that has to be maintained. And many teams use TLA plus to study a certain kind of bug in an existing system by extracting it into a high-level specification. And as we've said a couple of times throughout this talk here, because TLA plus is not code, we can abstract away in this mathematical model, can abstract away all uh, aspects of the code that don't matter, and then really only focus on the part that we care about. For example, in a distributed system, <coughs> excuse me, it's super easy to abstract away certain kinds of failure in a TLA plus model that are not relevant for the kind of problem we are interested in right now. I'm going to take the next one, Stefan. Okay, next question. When do you use pure TLA plus and when Pascal? Okay, so in this presentation, we didn't talk about Pascal. So Pascal is a kind of algorithmic language <laughs> that is a front end to TLA plus. So there's a, so it has a synt syntax that is more, um, more similar, I would say, to pseudocode, to imperative pseudocode. And some people prefer writing their specifications in Pascal. Some people prefer to write their specifications in TLA plus. So TLA plus is, is the more general language, right? So you can um, always write your specification in TLA plus. For certain systems, like in particular concurrent programs, um, it is probably easier to use Pascal. We didn't show it here because we didn't want to introduce a second language. Sometimes we call it a gateway drug to TLA plus. Okay, then the next question is, is testing arbitrary configurations for counter examples the main motivation to move from model checking to proof checking? Well, like Stefan said, a model checker can only verify a finite instance of the problem. Yeah? For our particular problem here, produce a consumer example for some value of n. And now we can run the model checker for multiple values of n, uh, but in reality, we can never check it for all values of n. And even for bigger one, it will probably run a very long time. Um, so if one needs higher assurances than model checking, then you resort uh, to theory improving to make sure that your algorithm works for any number of, of uh, n in this particular case. But there's obviously uh, a cost associated to theory improving. It's a more laborious process. It's a human process, whereas model checking is really throwing computer at the problem and waiting for an answer. So there's very little human effort when it comes to model checking. And at the end of the day, it's engineering judgment whether or not you need to go and do a theory improving or if model checking is good enough. OK, compare <clears throat> TLA plus TLC to other model checkers. Well, uh, so. TLA plus is the most expressive language that I know that is supported by a model checker. So if you compare to spin, uh, well, the, the input language, um, the modeling language that spin uses, so Promela, is kind of a 
toned down C dialect. So it's, a, it's at, a, at a much lower level of abstraction. And that has advantages and disadvantages. The main advantage is that um, spin can be much more efficient than, uh, than TLC. So if you, uh, if you look at the numbers of states per second that uh, the model checkers process, spin will be, will be much faster. However, you have to keep in mind that uh, the, the steps that, that you take tend to be much smaller because you're on a, on a lower level of abstraction. So there's a trade-off here. And uh, well, there's no, no universal answer. I mean, spin is a great tool. I've been using it uh, a lot in, in, in teaching and so on. And if it does what, what, what you want to do, uh, that's 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 awesome, right? Then then use it. TLA plus is more broad spectrum language, and you can you can um, you can write your specifications at higher levels of abstraction. And one thing that you can do in TLA plus that you cannot do in Spin is comparing two specifications at two different levels of abstraction. So we didn't have time to talk about that, but there's a concept of refinement. And you can write a very high level specification of your system and then a lower level specification that is closer to your implementation and show that your implementation corresponds to the abstract specification that you write that you wrote first. And spin will just not be able to do that because its input language cannot handle that. Okay, then I go next. Um, I think there are two related questions here. Uh, could you please recommend any good source for extracting specs from existing code bases? Are there any projects that attempt to automate this process? And then related, have you used tools like ChatGPT to generate TLA plus specifications? If so, what's your experience? So lifting a specification out of existing code is as of today, a manual task. And tools such as ChatGPT, they generate a TLA plus specification, but there is fundamentally an impedance mismatch here because code has all the detail that's required to efficiently execute an algorithm on silica. Whereas in a high level TLA plus specification, your high level implies that we don't care about many of the idiosyncrasies of programming languages and programs. We care about the algorithm, yeah, we care about this diet. We, we think at the level of this diagram that we start this talk with. So this, any tool that could, that we would build would have to know what are the details that don't matter that it can drop. And as far as I know, there is no tool out there that can actually do that. If you have ChatGPT generate a specification, your specification will look like the code just encoded TLA plus, and then there is no win. Okay, so I'll take the other one. Do you know use cases of TLA plus other than distributed systems and concurrent algorithms? Yeah, okay. so <clears throat> I mean, indeed, uh, most uses of, most documented uses of TLA plus are for those uh, classes of systems. But for example, TLA plus has been used at, at Intel and also uh, ARM, for example, for describing processor architectures. So it's it's not restricted to that. It's just that it's most popular in, in that community. That is true. Okay, are there easy ways to visualize a model checking instance and state transitions similar to Alloy? Um, there are a few visualizations built into TLC. You can visualize the state graph. You can also visualize the action space um, with no effort whatsoever. Um, perhaps what we also have, and for that I will quickly, oh, I'm still sharing my screen, perfect. I think I have it somewhere here. We have a way to animate these counter examples in, in TLA+. It requires you writing, um, a little bit of TLA plus that lays out the uh, this diagram here. But if you look, this is our visualization generated from the TLA plus counter example that visualizes what's going on with this counter example here. Yeah? And then we have several frames that show show the actual error trace graphically. And for systems, for bigger systems, usually it pays off from my experience at some point to come up with these visualizations to reason through um, through counterexamples. We also have integrations with third-party tools 
like interactive communication graph tools to make sense of the communication going on in distributed systems. Okay, uh, when will we next? I have no idea. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we've been discussing to have some um, some other webinars on, on TLA Plus. So if you're interested, uh, please let us know and, and uh, let us know suggestions. So there is now this TLA uh, Foundation within the Linux Foundation. That's why we are hosted here by the Linux Foundation today. And indeed, one of the purposes of the of the TLA Foundation is to produce more educational material about TLA plus. And of course, it will not just be the two of us, the, the other people as well that, that could uh, make such presentations. But thanks for your feedback. Well, thank you so much, Marcus and Stefan, for your time today, and thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you've joined us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.